Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, first of all, I'll start with who am I. Um, I am Mike Evans. I've worked with web technology since 1996. Uh, I'm currently a web developer. I have been for a while. Uh, did my PhD here at Plymouth. Got a patent in web technologies. Lectured at the University of Reading for 11 years. Uh, and for the last few years, uh, I've worked as a web developer in industry at places such as BBC News, SkyGo, Barts and Spencers, and I'm currently working on a project for Hive. So what I'm going to talk about in this particular uh, session, I'm going to take the experiences that I've learned, both in academia and in industry, and kind of set the scene for where web development is at the moment, because it's fundamentally transformed. I've been developing for the web for, for years, as I've just shown, um, but it's never been uh, more innovative than it is at the moment. So I'm going to start very briefly trying to set the scene, put things in context by looking at the existing, the original browser wars from right when the web uh, was beginning. I'll then move on and look at the way that the innovation in the browsers and the innovation in the web sphere um, has led to richer client-side development. From there, I'll move on and I'll talk about the framework wars, which is currently where we are now with this massive innovation that's come in in the last couple of years with client-side development. Um, and then I'll talk about the future of the web. And the future of the web generally extends for about six months, so if I was to do this talk again next, next year, it would be completely different. Now, classic web architecture, when the web was very first developed, you had a client and you had a server, and that was largely it. And the server did everything. Now, you might remember a lot of the existing languages that existed on server-side development. Many of them are still around. Right back in the early days, you had CGI, the common gateway interface. But then server-side scripting languages emerged, such as any of these. Like you say, most of these are still around today. The server had to provide the rich functionality that was demanded of any website. As soon as you wanted to make anything like a dynamic website, the server had to do everything. So all of these things the server was tasked with doing. In contrast, the client was rather dumb. Didn't really have an awful lot to do, couldn't really do an, an awful lot of things. All it had literally was form handling, and then any kind of processing was handed off to the server. But Netscape realized that the browser needed a little bit more than this. It needed its own programming language to enable interaction to take place within the browser itself. And so JavaScript was developed very early on uh, in the history of the web. Uh, it's very common tell, and it's actually true, that JavaScript was designed in 10 days in May 1995 by Brendan Eich for, uh, for, uh, for Netscape, who's still very, very prominent in the web development field today. It's a glorious object-oriented functional hybrid. It's not a full object-oriented language by any stretch. In fact, if you go down the object route with JavaScript, it will bite you because it's not particularly pleasant. If you treat JavaScript as a functional programming language, certainly with the latest version of JavaScript, you'll find yourself working much more aligned with the way that JavaScript itself as a language was originally designed, largely because it was based on scheme and self. Um, functional programming languages, but with a syntax similar to Java. And the reason for this was because it was designed to appeal to Java coders, so not to spook the Java coders who were seen as the, the big deal back in the day. Indeed, Netscape expected JavaScript not to be the main programming language, but just to add a few sprinkles of functionality with all of the main uh, processing taking place on the server. And so what existed in early client-side development was any kind of functionality that you wanted to have in the actual browser was provided um, by effectively an island of functionality, some other completely different plugin using a different language that would do all the heavy lifting. You would have the document object model, the DOM, in the browser itself, which would enable you to programmatically access the HTML elements and make your menu go up and down and a few animations and stuff like this. But any kind of heavy lifting, any kind of functional programming uh, processing that you wanted to do would be provided by a plugin such as a Java applet, Adobe Flash, Shockwave, or ActiveX. And what's interesting these days is they're all dead. None of them exist anymore or are being supported. Whereas JavaScript also nearly died. Obviously it hasn't, but it nearly did back in the day. If you look back at the history of the JavaScript standards process, you'll see that JavaScript itself first created in 1995 
first standardized as ECMAScript in 1997 as a way to try to pin down JavaScript as a standard that all the different competing browser vendors could support. The next versions of JavaScript, well, ECMAScript 2, 1998, ECMAScript 3, 1999, ECMAScript 3.1, 2008. All of a sudden, all of the development around JavaScript kind of stopped around the year 2000 and stopped for a long time. The reason for this, surprisingly, was Internet Explorer, because Internet Explorer had the monopoly on the market. And those of you who remember it back, uh, back then, everybody used Windows. This is before the age of the smartphone, before the age of Chrome, before even the age of Firefox. Everybody used Windows. Everybody, therefore, used Internet Explorer. Microsoft wanted to tie people's use of Internet Explorer um, to Windows so that if you use the web, you had to use Windows. In other words, the two, in Microsoft's eyes, it wanted to be uh, interchangeable. So in other words, they, Microsoft didn't want cross-browser compatibility. Ideally, they didn't want JavaScript either. They'd have preferred for you to use VBScript or ActiveX or one of their own technologies rather than some other language that you could also use on a different browser. If all the web developers developed for Internet Explorer, the chances were that they could kill any other form of browser, which obviously they successfully did for a while, um, and they would therefore retain their monopoly both in the operating systems and with the browsers. ECMAScript 4 was started in 2000, but there wasn't a lot of support behind it. Microsoft were like, shh, just, just go away, we don't really want that. And so the standard was never released, it just kind of died a death. Now, Internet Explorer held JavaScript back, and the reason was IE5 used a poorly implemented version of JavaScript 3. Now, this wouldn't be a bad thing on its own if there was a competing browser, but this was when Netscape was starting to die. And when I say poorly implemented version of JavaScript 3, JavaScript 3 itself wasn't exactly a great language, but a poorly implemented version of it was quite horrendous to work with. But this was IE5. IE5.5 also used the same poorly implemented version, as did IE6 and 7 and 8. So we've now reached all the way up to 2008 and we're still using a poorly implemented version of a really bad language that was developed in 1999. 2009 though, Harmony returns. And I use the term Harmony because this was the code name used for the development of what's become ES6, ECMAScript version 6. JavaScript in 2009, the standards were back on track. 2000's ECMAScript 4 was shelved. 2008 ECMAScript 3.1 was finally standardized to the extent that all the different browser manufacturers were like, yeah, okay, we'll work with that and we'll make it good and we'll all use the same version of 3.1. 2009, just to show that something was happening, they renamed 3.1 to ECMAScript 5. It's the same language. It's just that it had a few holes filled in and it was standardized across all the browsers. Now, what this actually means is that ECMAScript 5, which is the, if any of you have done any JavaScript programming, that's the JavaScript that you use today, that's actually ECMAScript 3.1, which was first developed in 1999. So, as you can see, it's kind of time for a change. And that's what we've got now. Harmony was the code name for the next version of JavaScript. And as you can imagine, having nearly 10 years' worth of no innovation at all to the language, there's a lot of new stuff in Harmony. Now, Harmony, being Harmony, was also known as ECMAScript 6, or more commonly known as ES6, or right at the last minute, as they decided to call it, ES2015. So it's already got a few different names. But fortunately, it's the same standard, and all the browsers have agreed to support it, and in fact, most of the browsers these days are supporting a wide number uh, of ES2015 standards. Now, just, just, just so you know, throughout this lecture, I've realized as I was looking at it earlier today, I'm so used to calling it ES6 that not only do I call it ES6 a lot, but in the slides, sometimes I call it ES6, sometimes I call it ES2015. It's the same thing, it's just the latest version of JavaScript. So what broke the deadlock? Well, competition, obviously. As you can see from this graph, uh, this was the Browser Wars 2.0. Microsoft's dominance fell Start, that was at its peak in 2007, and as you can see, around about 2012 was when all the different browser companies uh, all of a sudden had pretty much equal uh, levels um, of browser share. Now it's changed since, here we are at the end of last year, and Chrome was on a 45% share. So Chrome is in danger of becoming the new Internet Explorer, at least in the sense of having dominance. And it's never a good thing for one browser company to have dominance because the company that owns it will start to force through their own standards, 
not necessarily what the web or web developers need. But at the moment we're okay, and there's enough competition in the market that all the browser companies have to start singing from the same hymn sheet, because if one browser doesn't support the standards, there's so much competition and so much well-known competition out there that that browser will just be dismissed out of hand. So that's a rough guide to what's happened with the official uh, browser and the JavaScript standards over the years. But there's more to the story than this. If you're a web developer, you don't just rely on what the browser itself provides you, you also rely on what the community, what the development community can provide you as well, in terms of the libraries that are created, techniques that other people use, and different things along the way. And over time, even though JavaScript's innovation itself stalled, the actual innovation within the community itself never stalled. It still carried on going because people had to develop websites and that innovation was needed in order for people to develop websites in a way that wasn't quite as painful. And so we had this series uh, of technologies which over time have given us a richer and richer platform on which to develop applications on the client. If we take a step back and we think about the requirements of a client-side application development, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's just a list that I came up with when I was thinking about the type of things that I like to use when I'm developing websites. You need platform consistency. You need to know that the JavaScript you're working on is going to work across all the different browsers. Ideally, you'd like build tools so that whenever you're trying to get all your different libraries together and all the different versions and everything, something else is looking after that for you. You don't have to manage the different versions yourself. Good developer tools, you'd like to be able to debug successfully, you'd like to be able to trace through different stack flows and the like. Testing tools for unit testing. State management is important as well, because if you're trying to persist state or data in your application, where are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Processing performance is key. A nice terse syntax so that you can get lots of powerful things done in a really quick way without lots of verbose programming language statements coming out. And also, as it's a client-side application, some form of server communication would be good. Unfortunately, around about the turn of, of 2000, 2001, 2003, something around there, we had none of that. Back in the day, none of that existed. What we actually got, as far as debugging tools concerned, we had to use alert, which would pop up a little message with the variable that you were trying to actually see whether it existed or not. JavaScript, JavaScript was slow, it was fat, it was ugly wasn't consistent, none of the browsers were consistent, and state management, no, that didn't exist either. In other words, client-side development was really painful back in the day. Things slowly began to change throughout the 2000s, though, starting really with asynchronous JavaScript and XML, otherwise known as AJAX. Now, what I love about AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML doesn't have to be asynchronous, no longer uses XML, so JavaScript. Um, but what it became is, is a way to actually for the JavaScript client to communicate with the server and to retrieve data in a way without having to reload the page, which these days sounds like, well, okay, well, why wouldn't it? But back in the day, if ever you wanted to communicate with the server, you had no choice but to refresh the page. All of a sudden, Ajax meant that your client could now communicate with the server whenever it wanted to without having that page to be refreshed. Ironically, it was first developed by Microsoft in 1998, but it was used and abused and suddenly became very useful and so was adopted by other browsers in 1999 and became the XML HTTP request object. More recently, it's become the fetch object. It was the missing glue between the client and the server and it enabled the first Web 2.0 kind of uh, client-side web applications to be developed when Gmail and Kayak.com started to use it in 2004. At the same time, JavaScript libraries started to come out. The actual JavaScript community, people who were so sick and fed up of trying to work with a, a bad language that was poorly implemented, started to create libraries that would paper over the cracks. And the most popular, and certainly the most popular that I think pe most people know, is jQuery. Created in 2006 by John Resig, two things that it did. Firstly, it papered over the cracks across all the different browsers. So rather than each browser having a poorly implemented or differently implemented version of a JavaScript feature, you would have a consistent programming API to code with. So the same functions could be used, and you'd know they'd work in all the browsers, because jQuery would, would take care of all the underlying differences underneath. At the same time, it provided a nice terse syntax. 
if you manipulate the DOM using the DOM's API to create a new class or delete an element or add a div or change color or anything that you're trying to do programmatically with a web page, if you're using the document object model, the DOM's uh, functions to do that, they're very long, very lengthy, very wordy, very painful to use. jQuery and a number of the other libraries that came along, such as Prototype, Mootles, etc., they provided a much nicer syntax for accessing the DOM. So, for example, this is part of the DOM API. This is one of the functions that you'd use to get all the divs on a page. This is how you do it in jQuery. If you wanted to add a class to an element, well, first of all, you'd have to make sure that if l class list basically means that does this particular browser support the actual property element dot class list because not all the browsers did. That was another thing that jQuery would take care of for you. So that's all you needed to do in jQuery. jQuery gave you a way of programming the client side web in a way that was much nicer than before. So now if we look at our requirements for client side application development, well it's still not great, but we now have platform consistency and server communication, which is a bit of a start, a bit better. Now as far as debugging tools are concerned, Firefox kind of came along as well around about the mid-2000s with Firebug as a plugin that finally gave people, web developers, a way of debugging their code so that you could actually start to look at a stack trace and start to query different variables to actually make sure that the code was actually doing what you expected it to do. Console log various um, elements that you wanted or various bits of data so that you didn't need to do alert pop up the actual value that you were looking for. JavaScript itself was slow still and it was still fat but marginally less fat because you could use the libraries to make things a bit faster. Mostly consistent, there were still a few holes in there, but the libraries would take care of that for you. State management, no. If you wanted to take care of state management, what people tended to do was actually manage the state in the DOM. By this I mean, if you wanted, for example, to toggle a switch on or off, you would physically change the actual value of the switch, maybe by giving it a different class on or a class that was off, something like that. In other words, the actual state of the user interface was being stored within the user interface itself. There was no model for the actual client itself. The user interface was what you got. If you wanted to know whether a menu was dropped down or not, you had to query the element to see whether it was down. A very slow way of trying to store a user interface's state. 2008, things really started to, to, to come up. Google launched Chrome. Its most important innovations for web development, by far, was the V8 JavaScript engine. Not only was this super fast, it was also portable. Vastly superior JavaScript compilation speed meant that all of a sudden, as a web developer, you didn't need to worry about JavaScript being really slow and not being able to perform many of the processing that you wanted it to do, because suddenly, JavaScript was a lot faster. So you could get it to do a lot of the things that it could never do before. It also forced other browsers to, to improve their performance. So you suddenly got a massive innovation across the board with all the browsers improving their performance. Now, to give you an indication of how much faster it was, this is a benchmark of its speed. Now, kind of take it with a pinch of salt, because as everybody knows, benchmarks can be, well, kind of manipulated, shall we say, and other benchmarks won't show quite so dramatic, but without doubt, Chrome, when it first came out, was head and shoulders faster than all the other browsers. And like I say, it forced all the other browsers to become just as fast as well, so that now they're all kind of level pegging. Better speed meant better libraries. If all of a sudden your browser could be capable of processing so much more without slowing down, you could create more functional libraries. They didn't just paper over the cracks, but provided support for developing rich client-side applications. And so in 2010, we had a range of new libraries suddenly coming out, such as Backbone and Underscore. We had new templating systems as well. Previously, any templating language was always out on the server side, where you try to assemble the HTML that you needed to do in something like PHP or JSP, add a bit of functionality to it, and send the whole thing as a finished website, a web page to the client. But now, with JavaScript being very performant, you could do that templating language in JavaScript itself and have the client render the HTML elements that it needed to. JavaScript was now fast enough to render the HTML as well as the actual JavaScript code it needed to, all on the client. 
So, looking at our requirements once more, we're starting to get a bit more along the way to a richer programming environment. Our processing performance has now improved. Chrome also introduced Chrome DevTools, which is a marvellous tool for actually developing on the web because it gives you a really rich set of tools for querying the code and to, for debugging it, which you need if you're going to be developing any code. JavaScript well, is faster. A little bit less fat, still fat, but faster, a lot faster. Mostly consistent still. State management, yes, yeah, still in the DOM. We've still got a few things to do. The portability side of V8, the Chrome JavaScript engine, is where things start to get really interesting. Because it meant that V8 was, an, was a module within Chrome, but it didn't have to be in Chrome. It wasn't tied to the browser. It wasn't tied to any browser. It's an independent module. It's also available open and freely, and so it can be used as a standalone high-speed JavaScript engine anywhere you want. So why not put it in a server? Of course, why would you not put a JavaScript engine in a server? And no JS was born. And that says JavaScript in the browser because I forgot to change it to server in earlier this morning. That should be JavaScript in the server. Now, May 2009, Ryan Dahl did just that. He took the V8 processing parsing engine and placed it in a server and created a radical new server architecture, Node.js. It's much lighter than traditional web server architectures, uh, such as Apache, and it let dev, lets devs write server-side code in JavaScript. And never underestimate how much easier it is to write code if you're looking at client-side code and server-side code, which themselves, if you're writing both at the same time, is actually quite a tricky thing to do because of the competing things that you need to worry about uh, with client-side and server-side. They've both got different uh, functional requirements for them. If you're then having to write it in two different languages, it slows you down because there's a massive context switch between writing in JavaScript and then suddenly going over to PHP or JSP or something and writing in PHP or Java. If you then have to go back to JavaScript, you've got to do this whole massive context change again and it really slows you down. If both client and server are written in the same language, you're using the same syntax, the same idioms, even in some cases if you're writing your code nicely, the same code. If you're writing some kind of business logic, for example, that doesn't really care where it sits, it's just a function that transforms some data, put it on the client or put it on the server. So it's nice being able to write client and server in the same language. More importantly though, or maybe as importantly, Node brought build tools to the web. And this is where things have really started to explode. Without build tools, JavaScript had no compile process. You literally wrote your code, and then you had to insert it into the actual browser using a lovely script tag. Now that's fine when you're the only person writing the code. If you've got a team of people who are writing a code, and they're all writing different files, then you've got a number of script tags that have to go in, each script tag relating to one of the files that people are writing on. That's a pain, particularly if one particular file has been updated at a faster pace than another, you've got breaking changes, etc. It's even more of a pain when suddenly you're starting to use libraries from third parties. Maybe you're using jQuery, maybe you're using underscore and backbone, and all these different libraries that they depend on. Suddenly you've got to bring in their libraries, again using the script tag. Now, though, you've got dependencies, whereby if you have one particular script tag, one library that's depending on another, you've got to make sure the order of the libraries that you load um, are actually in, in sync. If they're, if they're out of order, then you're going to have one library that's expecting something else that's not actually there yet, and your program will crash. There was no concept of modules. You had dependency issues, as I've just explained. If one bit of code is dependent on another, not so easy to manage the dependency between the two. Uh, and there was no unit testing tools, so you're never quite sure if your code actually worked or not. Node helped this because it provided, first of all, uh, a command line interface. Suddenly, you could use JavaScript to actually start executing commands in the operating system. Things like reading files, writing files, deleting them even, which is what you need if you're creating a build tool, as I'll show in a second. And then the Node Package Manager, which enabled JavaScript modules to be packaged with their dependencies. So if you had a third-party library that depended on other libraries, bundle them up all at once. All you need to do is npm install this library, npm would take care of it for you. If the version started to update, and trying to get the versions in sync is sometimes a pain even now, but it was much more of a pain when you had to do it manually, these days, you just let NPM get on and do, do it. You just say what version you want, or whether you want the latest version, and it will manage the versions for you. 
It's not perfect by any sense, but it's so much better than before when it had to be done manually. And these are just some of the tools now available. In the last few years, there's been an explosion of build tools. There's a huge com competition almost amongst the different build tools as they try to do things to give you much more stuff within the actual development of your uh, application, not related directly to your code, but things about managing your code base, bringing the versions under control, unit testing your code, deleting files, creating a distribution version of your, your code, creating a dev version, running unit tests, all of these things that aren't directly related to your code itself, but which need to be done when you're creating a production-ready system. Those are some of the build tools. We've got different module loaders, different package management systems, and these change every year. It's, it's quite bewildering. I normally leave this to other people to do. I start at a new place and I'm like, well, what build tools do you use? And they're like, oh, we use this, this, and this. And I'm like, and who does that? And they say, oh, so-and-so's done that. And I'm like, okay, I'll ask so-and-so when I've got a problem, but I don't really want to go anywhere near there. They scare me. But joking aside, the build tools are invaluable because they automate the process for you. It's a nightmare trying to get everything in line without the build tools. And so the fact that once you've got them pinned down, they do everything for you just with a single command makes your life as a developer so much easier. And testing tools, unit testing tools, not just one or two unit testing tools, but a whole array of different unit testing tools. Again, there's more different types of unit testing tools than you, that you can use than in pretty much any development environment. So JavaScript has gone from having no unit testing tools to a huge amount of unit testing tools. So a typical build process, once you've created your, your uh, code, this is kind of what it looks like these days. You need to manage your JavaScript modules, and your build process will take care of that. You'll use some library somewhere, some build tool, um, that will start to manage the different modules. You and your team, each now, you're creating files. Those files will be created as individual nice modules. You'll use a build tool to build to all the modules together to make sure that when it's included in the final web page application, all the dependencies are there where they need to be. External library version control, so that if you've got, say, the latest version of React, which requires the latest version of Redux, maybe, that you've got them actually in the version that they need to be, so that you're not going to get one particular library fall over because you're using an older version of another library. Your build process will run unit testing for you. So as soon as you click, you might click deploy, for example. Click deploy. You might type in uh, deploy in your build tool, and it might be a process that runs this, whereby it will run your unit testing for you automatically. Uh, it will run code linting to make sure that as developers, you're developing according to the standard that's required of the place that you're working at. It will import module dependencies so that the actual code that's running can get to the modules that it needs to do. Maybe it will concatenate the modules together so that rather than have thousands of individual files, it will join them together as one giant file. Might transpile the code, which is something I'll talk about a little bit later. If you're using SAS or less libraries for your CSS, it will compile those into standard CSS. Might even split the code. Sometimes you need to split the code, even though you've joined it all together. Sometimes you then need to break it up again. Particularly if you're using internationalization, you don't want all the world's languages being compiled into one big file if you know that that person, for example, is from France. Just give them the French language. And so it will split the code accordingly according to that. You might want to generate source maps, because if you're using a different language than, than JavaScript, which again is something I'll talk about shortly, you want to make sure that when you're debugging that code, you're actually debugging the code you've written, not the code that's been transpiled uh, by the transpiler. Again, I'll talk about that later. You might want to uglify the code, if it's not ugly enough already, uh, in order to make sure that nobody else can read it. Minify it, simply to make sure that it's as, as compressed as it possibly can be to save on bytes and run end-to-end -end testing to make sure that it is actually doing what the users want it to do. All this is part of a continuous deployment process, so that as soon as you've finished your code and you push your code to GitHub or whatever you're using, all of this build process will take place, and in some places that I've worked, you literally deploy your code that's been nicely code reviewed by going npm deploy or whatever, and literally within an hour or so, it will be spit out, spat out and the end user will see it goes through that pipeline for you, and the end user sees a beautiful production-ready bit of code with your new bit in it. So, when it comes to our requirements for client-side app development, 
we're now in a much better place than we were. You can see how Node and NPM and the build tools have given us a lot of what we needed in order to make rich client-side application work. Our debugging tools are now good. JavaScript still is all right. Consistency is now genuinely there. We're now talking around the 2010, 2011 mark, so consistency is genuinely there in the browsers. State management, yeah, it's still in the DOM. What we do have, though, is one of the richest set of development tools of any language or platform. And it's amazing just how quickly all this has happened. True desktop class applications can be written entirely in the browser. And with all of this uh, innovation within the tools, the language, the browsers themselves, came new frameworks to take advantage of all of that. Because all of a sudden developers realized, if you want to develop an application, it's always better to develop it on the client, because that's where the user is. So as much of the processing that can be done on the client is better for the user, because ultimately, it's faster to actually work with it. But developing applications that do a lot is hard. So the frameworks came along in order to provide a platform on which you can actually develop genuinely rich client-side applications without having to rewrite everything yourself. So now we move into part three, which is the framework wars. And this kind of is where we have been for the last couple of years, although even that is changing now. What I've done, I've kind of listed what I think a web app comprises. And again, it's not an exhaustive list, it's just what I was thinking about uh, when I was writing these slides. So we've got all these things here that you kind of need to do if you're actually writing any kind of rich client-side application. Now, if you're using a library, it will generally do one of these things. A library should be such that it's small enough that it does one thing and it does thing, one thing well. It's something you build with. In other words, if you were going to create an application that does all of these things, you'd have many different libraries to help you out, or you'd have to start writing your own. A library has no opinions on structure. A framework, though, is a much larger, all-encompassing uh, set of tools. Largely, it's just JavaScript, API, but it does all of these things for you. Some of Angular JS will literally do all of that for you. It's something you build on. You use the library's API to do the things that you need to do. So ideally, all you can focus on is the business logic you need to do, get your uh, application to do what it needs to do. And a framework will provide application structure in a very opinionated way that you must follow. There has been an explosion of frameworks, unfortunately. I say unfortunately, it's a great thing because of all this innovation. But if you're a web developer and you're trying to get your head around things, almost every week there's a new framework coming out. Now, the framework, some examples there. I'm going to focus on AngularJS version 1 uh, and Re React and Redux for the remainder of this talk. But all of those different frameworks there will kind of do the same thing, just in different ways. But one thing you can do with them is to create a single page application. Now, this is based on the concept that if you think about what's happening in the, client, in the browser when you go to a particular URL, if you start interacting with that web page and clicking on links, normally you're taken to a completely different page. If you're taken to a completely different page, all of the state, all of the data that's been stored within that page suddenly got rid of. So you go to a different page, and unless you've done something clever, the browser's like, okay, I'll go to this different page now, and I've completely forgotten what was happening there. So if you go back to that page, it's like you've never existed again. Of course, there are ways around that, but in a general way, you go to a different page, and you've thrown away all the JavaScript, all the state, all the memory, anything that was there, you've thrown it all away, and you have to start all over again when you go back to it. What the developers of the frameworks realized was that, well, not only was this a bad thing, but that they could get around that. And this is where the concept of the single page application was born. What you do, you create a router, that's what the frameworks have done, they've created their own routing system, whereby if you land on a particular page, if you start to click links that are part within that same domain, the JavaScript framework itself will intercept the fact that you've clicked on that link, it will stop the browser navigating to a different page, and it will then regenerate the HTML according to what you want that second page to do. But it's doing it within the same single page. So, for example, uh, the SkyGo web app, which is something that I worked on, that now is an AngularJS application. So if you click on, for example, uh, if you go searching around for... Um, I don't know, the documentary list, and you find a documentary that you want to go to, um, if you click on 
any of the links there, because there are lots of links, you start going down, and maybe you come out of it, maybe you go, oh, when's Game of Thrones on or something like that. You start clicking on any of the links there. Even though it looks like you're going to a different page, to the browser, you're still on the same page. What's happened is, AngularJS in this case has recognized the fact that you want to change the way that the actual page looks, so it tears down some of the JavaScript that's there, but the data that's behind it still persists. A lot of the structure of the JavaScript still persists. So when it regenerates the page, much of it's still in memory anyway. So it's very, very quick. All it has to do is use Ajax to go and get some of the new data that it wants, and then just regenerates the page for you. So it's much faster than getting the server to do it for you. So this is where we're at now with the single page applications and so you'll see this increasingly with a lot of the different, um, whether it's payment sites that you're using, uh, applications like SkyGo, for example, they're all tending to move towards this concept of the single page application because it means that you're, even though you're using a browser, there's no delay, there's no latency in the user interface that you're using. You click on something, it happens almost instantly because there's a tiny amount of data that's being sent to the server and the rest of everything that you see is being generated on the client. So let's look at some of these frameworks in a bit more detail. I won't go into extensive detail. AngularJS was developed by Google. It was actually developed just shortly before this, about 2009-ish, but it actually came out as a thing for the community in 2010. It's a giant framework for large single-page applications. It started off as quite a big framework, but it then became huge. And it focuses on developing large-scale apps. I think PayPal use it, quite a few of the other big-name uh, companies use it. A lot of enterprise companies use it. If you've got a form-heavy application, then AngularJS is perfect for that. It uses a declarative presentation syntax, with the idea being that you create essentially your own HTML tags. So rather than have uh, UL and LI to create a list, you create your own list tag, and then create what's known as directives, or what's now called components, underneath it to provide the functionality to do that. Effectively, you create your own markup with AngularJS. So if you're creating the functionality behind the tags, the idea is that you as a developer create the functionality. You then give these new tags to your designer and say, OK, knock yourself out. This is what these tags do. Here's a new calendar tag. Here's a new carousel tag, things like this. And the designer will go, OK, well, I can do this. And they don't need to worry about understanding the JavaScript behind it. In this way, Angular is very much HTML-centric. It brings JavaScript back functionality to declarative HTML components. You write your application in the HTML and provide the JavaScript behind it to give those HTML markup directives the functionality that they need. Effectively, then, it's enhancing HTML to support logic. It is a complete application framework. It's testing focused. It even comes with its own tools to help you test uh, as wh whatever needs to be tested. It was developed before ES6, ES 2015, which has its own promises library. So Angular needed to come with its own promises library. Now promises is just a way of managing asynchronous calls. Um, it's a nice way of managing asynchronous calls and much better than using callbacks that was traditionally used. But because they didn't exist in the, in the actual JavaScript language when Angular came out. Angular had to provide its own promises library, and that's not a trivial thing to do. It's got its own testable, mockable Ajax library. So there's a version you can use Ajax uh, within it using, your own, uh, using Angular's own uh, tools to do that, but you can also mock those tools out for unit testing. It uses two-way data binding which is really good because it means that if you've got uh, a, an input, for example, for the user to enter some data, uh, and you've bound that to a variable or an object or something like that uh, within your code, whenever the user enters anything in the input, your code's value automatically changes. But equally, should you run off and get some other data from the server and that value changes, then what the user sees automatically changes as well without you having to do anything. So the user input and the code behind it are absolutely linked in, in a nice two-way uh, means. And that's really nice to use. There's dependency injection, which I won't worry about, and the directives, which are the HTML, and obviously the routing. Now, in contrast, and in stark contrast, we have React, which couldn't be more different. Actually developed by Instagram, 
uh, but then Facebook bought out Instagram and so is now a Facebook thing. Largely came out in 2013 to the community at large and rather than it being a big giant framework it's a small library for providing a view of a user's data. Libraries should be do one thing and one thing well. React focuses on providing a view of a user's data. It focuses on developing small user interface components that are blazingly fast. That's what it predominantly goes for, speed. It's JavaScript centric. So whereas Angular is HTML centric, React focuses on JavaScript. It brings HTML based templ templating into JavaScript components. And it enhances JavaScript to support markup. Like I say, the exact opposite of Angular. Angular, you're creating lots of different directories in your HTML with JavaScript behind them. With React, you're creating JavaScript objects that just happen to have an HTML-like syntax for the presentational side of things. But that HTML is still JavaScript. Key features of React, it creates a virtual DOM of its components. So if you were to create a calendar component, which maybe has lots of nice divs and different classes in there and all sorts of different things in there, rather than actually manipulating the browser's document object model, the browser's DOM itself, it creates its own virtual DOM in memory, which is much smaller and much faster because it's not the entire DOM of the page. It's just the DOM of that component that you're working on. Whenever your virtual DOM changes, if your component does something or the user does something that interacts with the component to make it change the presentation of it, to make it change the elements that it's using, that virtual DOM obviously changes. So in other words, if you clicked on a new date in the calendar, you maybe want the date that you've clicked on to change a different colour. Ordinarily, you'd have to change the actual browser's DOM to do that by assigning a different class name, perhaps. With React, it's the virtual DOM that you're changing. But at some point, that virtual DOM has to make its changes known to the DOM itself. And so what it does, React will go through all of the different com components, query them all to see if any of them have changed and only the changes that have been made are applied to the DOM itself in the browser. The reason for this is that the DOM is the main bottleneck when it comes to processing. The DOM is really slow. So by using a ver this virtual DOM concept uh, in memory and only small portions of the DOM itself, uh, React is able to make uh, rendering extremely fast because you're only changing the actual DOM that needs to change. You're not re-rendering all of the DOM itself. This results in blazing fast performance, but React has also been kept deliber deliberately minimal. It doesn't have framework-like features. Comparing Angular with React, it's not really like-for-like -like at first glance because React isn't a framework. But where it becomes a framework is where you start to use many of the other libraries that are out there that provide the framework-like features that you need for developing your application. So whereas Angular will provide everything for you out the box, with React, you've got a huge range of different libraries to choose from, but enough that you can just pick what you need and there's your framework. But it's a framework that's tailored to you. Which makes you wonder which is better. Is it going to be Angular or is it React? There is, in fact, only one way to find out. Angular, well, its full DOM uh, is re-rendered, uh, sorry, full DOM render is triggered whenever bound data changes. Now, what this means is the data that's bound to the user interface components, in other words, uh, a text input, for example, whenever that, user, whenever that data changes, either programmatically or by the user, the whole DOM itself is re-rendered. Now, that's a slow and potentially painful process. It uses something called dirty checking, which means that every data object that's bound in some way to the user element, and you decide which data objects they are, but they're basically anything that you want to process with, any of those data objects, if any of them change, all of the DOM that's bound to the actual values, uh, to the actual objects that, that you're using, they all have to be checked. And each object that's bound to an element, you don't just check one value in the object, you have to check the object no matter how big or deep the object it is. And if one of those bound object changes, they all have to be checked to see if any of them have been changed, because that's the only way the data binding can happen. This is a slow process, because you're talking about exhaustively recursing all of the actual objects that you've used each time any one object changes. And if one object changes and it causes a change to another object, 
well, then that other object has changed. So you have to go back to the start and go through them all over again. And you can get uh, caught up in an infinite loop of objects that are changing, that are changing dependent objects, that are changing the original objects that change that object. And it can get quite tricky and you can get quite caught up with the uh, two-way data binding. Two-way data binding, though, is ace when you get it right, but it is quite I easy to get it wrong. And it also makes, expensive, it makes it expensive for large or complex sets of data. Angular isn't as fast as React. It's got a lot faster. It's got certain APIs that you can use to make it fast, but you need to know what you're doing, and you need to know what they, those APIs are. And this is the key thing with Angular. It's a complicated framework. There's a lot of edge cases where you can be bitten by it if you don't do things in an appropriate way. With React, the data is bound to the virtual DOM. It works entirely in JavaScript, and it uses shallow checking. React doesn't have two-way data binding. It has one-way data binding. But this is OK. Because of the speed at which it works, it means that whenever you change your data, React effectively it refreshes the page, but it's not refreshing the whole DOM. It's only refreshing the virtual DOM, only those components that have changed. And so even though you may change some data, and it's refreshing everything, that everything is much smaller than it is in Angular. The shallow checking, for example, is where you're actually only checking to see whether the identity of an object has changed. The objects that React uses to check are immutable. They're pure objects. So if you want to change one, you have to create a new copy of that object. If you create a new copy, it's no longer got the same identity. So if you've got a large array of objects that are managing the components that you're working with, and React has to work out which of those has, has changed, it only has to go through and check the name of the object. Has the identity of this object changed? If it has, I'll need to re-render its, its virtual DOM as the actual DOM. But if the identity hasn't changed, the properties itself in the object haven't changed, so just ignores it. It doesn't need to query the object, it just needs to work out what the identity of it is. And that makes it blazingly fast. Only one-way data binding, but extremely fast. Now, Angular is a huge framework, but it provides everything you need. So you don't have to look elsewhere. If you want to use anything that I just showed you in order to create an application, Angular will do it all for you. There's no decision fatigue. You need to learn Angular, so there's a huge learning curve, but you don't need to worry about, oh, should I use this router or some other router? What uh, HTTP AJAX client should I use? It's all there for you with Angular. But there is a large learning curve, and it's very easy to make poor architectural choices, with, certainly with Angular 1. You can create, and I've seen this a lot of times, a big ball of mud, because if you do it wrongly, then you've just got a mess of code, and it's, it's not pleasant. Also, it runs only on the client. And as it's a single page application, this can be difficult if you want to use some uh, SEO search engine optimization, because search engines can't basically read what it is that you've developed. Whereas with React, it's a small library, so a smaller learning curve. It's isomorphic, and so will run on the client and the server. So now search engines can read the actual content that you've created, because it's, you can render it on the server, and it will just spit out HTML for the uh, search engines to read. But there is a huge problem with decision fatigue with React, because it is such a large ecosystem of different libraries. The only way you can work out which particular library to use, apart from trying to read the entire internet to work out what other people think, is to make your own choice and to dive in there with one of the different options. But there are many options. And by the time you've actually worked out that the library you're using wasn't the best one, you've already committed quite a few uh, hours in terms of actual development. There are dozens of routers, stores, communication libraries, you name it, dozens of them to choose from. And it's actually quite difficult trying to identify which particular set of libraries your team should use. Now, if we take a step back briefly, and we look at the requirements for our client-side application development, where has the frameworks uh, taken us to uh, with our particular requirements? Well, at the moment, I haven't really added anything to it. We already had quite a nice list of things to do. But state management and a ter syntax, they're still outstanding. So if we focus for the minute on state management, this brings us quite nicely to something called Redux. Now, this is a library 
but it's a predictable state container. It provides an area for you to store the state of your application. So any details that a user types in uh, to your user interface, that's the model of your application, for example. You want to store those somewhere. You don't necessarily want to store them in a database because you only need them to use them uh, during the application. If a user's querying TripAdvisor or Expedia and type in, yes, I want to travel on this date um, and I, I want to go to this country and I'm only looking in four-star hotels and I want them to be at least £150 a night or whatever. All of those details that you're typing in, that's state, that's data that the users enter in that the client should actually start to store. Where does it store it? Well, you either create your own objects to store it, but that gets messy, it's prone to error, uh, it's also inconsistent because the way that I create uh, a data structure to store that kind of data may be different from the rest of the teams. Mine inevitably will be better, but nonetheless it will certainly be different. What Redux gives you is a great way of storing the state that's consistent. It's consistent so that anybody can use it, everybody uses it in the same way, people can actually understand exactly what's going on because their model or the way that the user interface is currently presented is all contained within Redux. It's actually based on an old functional programming concept, so it's not new, but it's new as far as the JavaScript world is concerned and it's a great way of storing uh, the model for your data also features some nice things such as hot reloading which means that you can actually change your code on the fly and because your code is all broken up nicely Redux works with this quite nicely such that you can then actually change your code on the fly and only the bit of your code that's changed needs to actually be updated in the browser and because Redux is managing the state well, the state's still there so your code will then just work without any problem it's good for developers not so great for users time travel is an awesome feature of Redux because again Redux is doing uh, is using pure functions again this whole concept of the functional programming paradigm it's using pure functions to do what it needs to do to manage the state which means that if you in Redux parlance dispatch an action to do something that action is telling Redux store this bit of data and in Redux will then store it in a big object that's basically all it's doing but it's doing it in such a way that there are no side effects. So if you then tell it again, store the same bit of data in the same place, Redux will go, well, OK, and nothing will change because you're doing the same thing. And you can do the same thing again and again. There are no side effects. And because of that, this means that if you perform, for argument's sake, four separate actions, you might add a bit of data, delete a bit of data, add another bit of data, and update a bit of data. Because you're doing that in such a way that's predictable, and is it done without side effects, if you then rerun those exact actions but in reverse order, you then undo exactly what you've done. And so that's what's meant by time travel. You can literally go forwards and backwards in the state of Redux, the actual store of the data that's being kept. All of those different actions just unwind the stack and you'll get back to exactly the same state that you were right from the beginning. Now the great advantage of this, it gives you automatic undo redo. That's all undo is. Undo is just undoing what you've done. And that's what this concept of time travel with Redux is. It lets your application state, you can actually trace the state over time and then wind it back as often as you want. And it works everywhere. Client, server, native, it's not tied to any framework. It's not even tied to React. It was designed initially with React in mind, but you can use it with, with Angular, you can use it Ember, you can use it anywhere. And so, this means that our state management now, if we use Redux, you don't have to, but it's a good thing to use, means that finally we're getting somewhere when it comes to client-side application development work. But we have framework fatigue. You probably have presentation fatigue, but we also have framework fatigue because it seems that every week a new framework or library emerges. These are just some of them I've not even mentioned yet, and they're already either out or on the horizon. Every week a new one comes out. React multiplies that problem. These are the different stores. If you don't want to use Redux, these are many the other ways of managing state that you could use. You could just plug and play into React if you want. What about if you want to use a router? React doesn't come with a router. You need to choose one of these or one of the other ones that are out there. Same with forms. You want form processing. Angular will process forms for you out the box. React won't, 
but some of these libraries will. Or maybe you want to use a different library. Either way, my point is, if you're using React, you've still got a huge number uh, of different choices to make. It's not pleasant when it comes to actually developing when you've got that much choice to make because there's always the danger of what if you make the wrong choice. You have literally made a wrong choice, you've committed to it, and it takes a long time to undo that particular uh, code that you've written. But now we've got Angular 2 that's coming out. And I'm not going to labour the point with this, but Angular 2 is as different to Angular 1 as JavaScript is to Java. And somebody once made the great quote that JavaScript is to Java like a carpet is to a car. Angular 2 is that different to Angular 1. It uses React's concept of the virtual DOM because that is a good thing. It uses Ember's router because Angular 1's router was a bit pants. But it also uses Microsoft's TypeScript, which is great because it gives you this concept of strong typing, which JavaScript doesn't have, but it's not really JavaScript. So now, all of a sudden, you're needing to code in a different language. You don't have to, but all of the different um, examples that you see online will tend to use TypeScript. If you want it to run natively on a mobile phone, you need to use a different library altogether, NativeScript. It uses ES2015, but that's okay, because everybody should, because it's great. Uh, and it uses something called RxJS for um, a lot of its processing internally. You don't have to again, but it will give you various advantages in terms of uh, observing different data and the way that it changes. It supports the web component syntax, which is a new standard that's allegedly coming out, but has been coming out for years now. And it works easily with Polymer, which is another framework, or yet another framework. In other words, a lot of this is a lot of headache. This is a huge framework in its own right, and everything you've learned about Angular 1 will help you not in the slightest with Angular 2 because it's so different. Now with all this, if you're in the web development sphere, it's so easy to be overwhelmed because it's like, my god, I've worked on projects, currently we're going to know for example, where previous version used Angular, current version uses React. So you've got to work both with different code bases, sometimes with Angular, sometimes with React, and even just those two, it's like, Ugh. But if you're then trying to keep up with the latest changes, it can be maddening. But there is a way to kind of manage at least some of the actual uh, development work that you're doing so that you don't lose track of the application you're trying to write. If you accept Redux to manage your application state, it's not tied to React so you can use it with anything, has bindings for many frameworks, if you use ES2015, which we all should because it's easy to use and it is a great addition to the language, it has nice module management which lets you write your uh, functions in a coherent file. It's exportable with its own API. In other words, you're encapsulating your functions in a nice module that can then be used anywhere. Namespace is it, so you don't need to worry about globals or anything like that. It's a really nice addition to the language. So I'll let you create independent exportable modules uh, of functions, your API effectively. You combine the two together, Redux and the ES6 modules, uh, for your framework neutral business logic. Your business logic is stuff like your data transformation, getting data from the server, processing it, maybe it's your form validation, whatever it is you need to do that's specific to your application, the code that you write should have nothing to do with any framework. Just literally make tiny little functions that have no concept whatsoever of the framework that you're using. You get Redux to manage the state, you're creating your business logic as a set of small functions, and you're exporting them as separate ES6 modules. You use the frameworks and libraries for what they're good at, which is the user interface, routing, data binding, and communication, and keep your business logic and state separate from the framework. What you end up with is this. There's the framework in all its glory. Don't let any of your business logic anywhere near the framework. Instead, keep it separate in ES2015 modules, totally separate from the framework. Things like form validation, data transformation, any calculations you need to use, anything that is literally just focused on processing your business logic and doesn't care about the framework. Anytime you need to manage state, if you need to persist data, do it in Redux. And what this gives you you can put your business logic on the client or the server. All of this can work either in Node or in the browser. So if you need all of a sudden, if somebody thinks it's a great idea to move some of it over to Node, fine, just move it over to Node. It can work as is. So you're nice and portable there. Whereas the framework that you're using now, well, if you're using Angular, if your boss suddenly says, do you know what, I really think we should use React, 
well that's fine. Yes, obviously you'll still have a, a certain amount of work to do because you've changed frameworks, but your business processes, your business logic is completely unchanged and can still be used as is. It's not going to keep you sane, but it will help. Now, I will finish. I know I'm running late. Am I alright to carry on? Right. I've got another five minutes. Yeah, well, they're not awake, but they're still there. Uh, I'll, I'll finish with the future of web development. Now, as I've said, this is where we ended up with. We need terse syntax. Terse syntax is nice, short, succinct syntax that lets you do a lot in just a few characters. We don't have that with JavaScript 5. But we do with ES 2015. It provides us not only with the terse syntax, but with new features as well. This is our terse syntax, or at least some examples of it, and I won't bore you with the details, but just note that back in the day, if you're used to writing functions like this, you can now write them like this. Takes a bit of getting used to, but once you do, it's awesome. Destructuring is a great uh, use of ES2015. If you want to, uh, if options here is an object, and you want to make sure that the, op the options object has some default values, this is how you'd write it currently with ES5, the current version of JavaScript. With ES6, ES2015, I, I told you I get them confused, you just write it like this, and it's much more succinct. Both of those do exactly the same thing, different syntax, but because you've got that different syntax, suddenly your code is a lot smaller. And because it's a lot smaller, it's so much easier to see and to work with, and you're doing a lot more than you ever did before in a much smaller series of characters. ES 2015 gives JavaScript superpowers. You have promises built in, so you no longer need to use an external library. Modules, as I've already talked about, they're fantastic. But a whole load of other stuff uh, that I won't go into, but which gives JavaScript so much more. Like I said, 10 years of frustrated innovation just suddenly came out and it's like, oh, here's JavaScript. It's nothing like JavaScript you've ever seen. It's awesome. But how can you use it? And this has one of been, always been one of the fundamental problems of the web. You're talking about a new standard. Now, the definition of a standard is something that the community has been using for a long time that suddenly has been seen as, actually, that's quite good, we should put that in the standard. In other words, almost by definition, standards should be behind the curve of innovation. But you've then got a chicken and egg problem, because if the community is using uh, a particular uh, certain technique that then, like promises for example, that then becomes encapsulated in the standard, but the standard is behind the curve and so the browsers don't support the standard, you still need to use libraries because the browsers aren't supporting the standard. So how do you get around that chicken and egg concept? It's bad enough with the years 2015, I've been talking about this for a while, I've used it in a big way this year, and it, it's just so different from ES, ES5, ES2008, uh, 1999, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's so different, and it's so much better, uh, but how do you use it, given that none of the browsers actually support it in its entirety? A lot of them support it to a large degree, but not in its entirety, and they all obviously support it in an inconsistent way. Worst of all, that's ES2015. And obviously now it's 2016, and the ES 2016 standard has been ratified. And of course there's going to be an ES 2017 standard, because now JavaScript, the standards body, have decided that they're going to release new versions of JavaScript on a yearly basis. How on earth can the browsers keep up with that? The answer is the gloriously named transpilation. Now, Compilation is what you might be used to, which transforms source code written in one language, such as C++ for example, into a very different language, assembly, some form of bytecode, or even machine code. What transpilation does, it transforms source code written in one language into another very similar language. So in other words, you convert ES2015 to maybe ES5, or TypeScript, CoffeeScript, or Dart to ES5. These are different languages, and the source code of these languages are being transpiled down to source code, to JavaScript ES5. So that's the difference between compilation and transpilation. Rather than compiling down to machine code, you're compiling source code down to source code. Babel is the key build tool to do this when it comes to ES6. Babel is not easy, but once you've got it in a line, it's great, because you can use any feature, no matter how experimental, of the ECMAScript standard, 
Currently, uh, I'm using some of the uh, ECMAScript 2017 stuff that's not been ratified yet. It's quite dangerous, obviously, because if they decide to change the standard, then you're like, yeah, kind of need to rewrite my code now. But you can kind of tell which of the standards are gaining widespread support and which have a strong chance of working, so you can get ahead of the, cu of the curve. You put ES 2015 in, like this, this is a function call here, and you get ES5 out for you. This is transpilation. This is what is happening. You are literally transpiling this into something that all browsers can read, ES5. Babel will transpile any, well, virtually any variant uh, of ECMAScript, any version of JavaScript, to ES5, or you can create your own plugin. You can also transpile other languages to JavaScript using other transpilers, and that's what all of these do. You can even transpile Java to JavaScript. All of these different programming languages here can be transpiled down to JavaScript where they're used natively in the browser. And so JavaScript has become the assembly language of the, lab, of the web. Why would you do this? Why would you compile down to another programming language, which doesn't seem very efficient? Well, JavaScript is the only language that's guaranteed to run on all browsers. Browsers only have the JavaScript compiler. And JavaScript has no standardized bytecode. Each browser will compile JavaScript to a bytecode, but they all use different bytecodes. So the bytecodes won't talk to each other across the browsers. So you can't compile, for example, C++, down to one particular bytecode because you'd have to do it for every different browser. V8 doesn't even use bytecode. V8 compiles JavaScript directly to machine code. One of the reasons it's so fast. To run in a browser, therefore, a program needs to use JavaScript. So if you want to use a different language, you have to compile it down to JavaScript. And that's not such a bad thing because it's still reasonably performant. So what we get with the transpiled web we have the machine code at the bottom, your browser-specific bytecode, and the JavaScript source. All of this exists in your browser. If you want to use a different language, you put something in your build process, a transpiler, Babel, or some other transpiler. If it's Babel, it will be working with ES 2015, any of the ExmaScript variants. If you want to use a different language, like TypeScript or CoffeeScript, you use a, a language-specific transpiler, and you can now use something like TypeScript, Elm, Dart, or whatever, and write there, and now start coding for the web like that. However, if you want to use something like C++, C Sharp, Rust, Go, or whatever, these will not compile down to JavaScript. They're just too different. They, they literally can't do it. So you can't write components in C, C++, or whatever, and get them to work in a browser. But you will later on this year. WebAssembly is being worked on right now. It's a virtual CPU for the web. It defines a new binary syntax for low-level code that will work within the browser. The browser's JavaScript engines will support this new binary syntax natively. And what it enables uh, developers to do, it, the WebAssembly compilers will compile other languages to this binary syntax. Your C++, your Go, whatever it is that you're using, will now compile not to JavaScript, but to WebAssembly. So it therefore provides a unified, and all the browsers will support the same WebAssembly standard, so it provides a unified compilation target for languages that currently don't transpile to JavaScript. All the main browser manufacturers are behind it and are working on it actively, and we can expect it in browsers later in 2016. So this is what we will get at the end of the year. Same with the transpilation web, where if we want similar languages to JavaScript that can transpile down to JavaScript, they'll work just as before. But with WebAssembly, any of the languages that we had before that require a compiler, like C, C++, or whatever, will now compile down to WebAssembly. And what this means is JavaScript can now communicate with any of the codes that you've got here all of the code that you write here will have its own exported API. The functions that are there, JavaScript can call, and JavaScript will just think it's JavaScript. So no more islands of functionality. It doesn't matter whether you write your API in JavaScript, in C, C++, Go, whatever it is, it will all be executable in the, in the, in the browser, and each different module from each different language doesn't care. It just sees the interface, just sees the function, and so it can make the function calls. 
So you get multi-threaded support, finally, native DUM integration at binary speed, at 20 times speed up of code, and the example here actually uses Unity, the 3D game engine, within the browser, running on WebAssembly. And it is, has the potential to transform the application. You will get Photoshop in the browser. You've already got variants that try to do the same thing, but they're hamstrung by the performance issues. If you're able to write applications in C++ that work natively in the browser and can communicate with the DOM and JavaScript as if they exist there, you will get native desktop applications within the browser. And that is it. Web development hurts. It always has, and it always will. But accelerated innovation is never painless. And it's now the most exciting time to be a web developer because of that innovation. It genuinely is painful, but it's also awesome because there's always something new coming out. I thank you. Are there any questions? And I apologize for taking too long. I do tend to do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.